Okay, I told you all I'd walk through or make a video of, like, here's how I would answer the questions. I'm not going to actually answer them for the practice problems, but I'll, I'll walk through it. So here's just, like, an overview of everything that we happen to have from the data set. So I see some categories with some numbers. Um, I see some continuous variables here that deal with a whole bunch of stuff. So... And then I have some where it just seems to be clusters of stuff, a whole bunch of numbers. Okay, let's see what we can do. And the following questions. You're interested in oxygen consumption from different species of blennies. Typically, as animals get larger, their oxygen consumption increases. You want to see if this trend applies to blennies. You study the smallest blenny is a red lip blenny, followed by bay blenny, and then seaweed blenny. And ordered by size. So this is small to big. Okay, take a first look at your data at using data descriptive statistics. Calculate the mean, variance, standard deviation, median. Uh, the variance is the standard deviation squared, for the sake of saying it. So if I wanted to figure out all of this stuff, I could use R statics. If I were to use R statics as from my library, I would probably group by you know the type of blenny, and then get summary stats for oxygen consumption. So obviously, you know, you'd have to get your file, you get your data, you do a pipe, you group by Blenny, you would pipe it again, then you get your summary stats. That's how I would go about this one. For the 95% confidence intervals, <clears throat> that would be using your QT of 0.975, and then your data set, or uh, your, sorry, your degrees of freedom. So you would need to do your summary statistics before you can figure out this one, you're not. I don't have any of the confidence intervals on the test, but that's what you'd have to do. You use this; that'll get you your t critical value, and then you could use that to um, calculate your ninety-five percent confidence intervals, just like what we did last week. Which blending can we confidently say is different from the others? How does it differ? So for this one here, you need your 95% confidence intervals to answer this one. So what I would do is just sit there and like, oh yeah, you know, the red lip blenny is from here to here and the bay blenny is from here to here and you know, the seaweed blenny is here to here. And then you'd say, oh look, this one here is definitely, or we can confidently say that it's different because, you know, it's an outlier. That That's what you'd do. But since you need the confidence intervals and we're not doing confidence intervals on this one, we're good. We studied three species in warmer water, so this is the blennies again. Now you're interested in them that live in colder UK waters, the top pot benny or blenny. You assume that the oxygen consumption measurements above the three warmer water species represent. So here in R, average all the R. So in R, average all the oxygen consumption rates. So this one here, that's going to be a population mu, is what you're being asked about. Uh, from your physiology class, you know that animals that live in colder environments typically differ okay, so we could make some hypotheses. So here what we're going to be talking about is, for this Tom Pop Blenny, what we're going to assume is... The average for the Tom Pot Blenny is the global average, and then obviously for my alternative is the average of the Tom Pot Blenny is not the global average. So you would test it out. Obviously, this here is doing t tests using t distributions. We're not necessarily doing that, but you know you could if you needed to, which would just be t dot test, and you put in the appropriate information. So you put in your data and what have you, so and what you think is the true average. So that you could do, hooray, 
for your conclusion, you just look to see if that p-value is greater than 0.05. If that turns out to be the case, we reject the null. State. And then you accept the alternative. And once you do that, you should probably even describe what that means. Here, if p is less than 0.05, we would say we fail to reject the null. give your statistics and then describe what that means. So yay. In a normal population of trees, the average seed size is this and the variance, so this one here is variance, is 0.85 millimeters squared, so that means standard deviation would be the square root of 0.85 millimeters squared. So what proportion of the seeds would you expect to be higher? So this one here would be a p-norm question, as opposed to 1 minus p-norm. Since we're asked for greater than, we're looking at this side, so this is most likely a p-norm problem. What two values encompass proportion of the seeds that are within 1.8 standard deviations? So that 1.8 is going to be our z-score. So to figure this out, we would have our average plus or minus the z-score multiplied by the standard deviation. Here you know that it's 2.7, our z is a 1.8, and our variance is the square root, or sorry, our standard deviation is the square root of 0.85. What seed size is 2.2 standard deviation units under the mean? So this one is also using this here, except that we would be using mu minus c times the standard deviation. You study a population of anole lizards in a small Caribbean island. Because this island is so small, you obtain all of the lizards, 138 of them. Out of this population, we notice that 90 of them have a yellow dewlap, whatever that means. What proportion of lizards on the population have that? That should be easy. If you sampled 16 of them, what's the probability? So this is going to be dealing with um, because we're dealing with four of them out of this. So here we're dealing with the probability calculations. And when you sample 16, so this here is we're subsampling. and you want 4 to have success, so here what we're saying is, hey, we're testing 16, but our successes turn out to be 4, so then you would just run your probability off of that. It's probability of sampling 8 lizards and getting none of them, so here we would say n equals 16, x equals 0. For both of these, we need to have a probability of success. This here is going to figure out our probability of success. which is what you're going to need for those two. In your bag of candy that you're bringing to the movies, 40%. Are you allowed to do that? I don't know. Anyway, 40% of the candy contains peanuts, 60% contains chocolate, and of those, 25% both chocolate and peanuts. What's the probability of choosing a piece that contains chocolate or peanuts mutually exclusive? That's just, is the, oh, is the probability of choosing a piece mutually exclusive? So obviously, you might want to look at that bit right there to determine if it's mutually exclusive. What's the probability of choosing a piece that has chocolate or peanuts, but not both? So you want the probability of the chocolate or, um, or the probability of peanuts, but not both. So we need to then get rid of. You un the union of them. Remember that the union calculation, if we were to place out of chocolate and peanuts, this thing is actually filled in twice, and since it's filled in twice, we have to double this amount. So it's probably a piece that contains chocolate, but not peanuts. So here, 
what you would need to do to have it contain chocolate but not contain peanuts is when you subtract out the probability of you getting the peanuts. Because if you do get rid of that, so probability of chocolate, get rid of the probability of the peanuts, we're going to get rid of anything that contains the peanut part. What's the probability of choosing a piece that contains neither chocolate nor peanuts? So this one here would be, you would look for the negation of them, so neither chocolate nor peanuts would just be an opposite. So this is an opposite problem. Your cousin finally wa watches Lord of the Rings with you. That should be underlined. The next day you're having a conversation with your family. You say that the average lifespan of a hobbit is 111. You fire back and say, no, the average lifespan of a hobbit is not 111. Then you realize that you need some quick stats to back up your claim. You run to your room and you do some quick... Search on one wiki to rule them all. Give them the data you find. Can you prove your cousin wrong? So this one here is a t-test problem. So what can we say? So we have to look up some stuff. So obviously here, the null hypothesis, what we would need to say is the average is 111. Here we'd say that uh, it's not. Then you calculate your T critical and all that stuff. I think. Let's see, was this in here? Do we have some Hobbit data? We do. We have some Hobbit data, so you could use your Hobbit data to figure it out. But like I said, this is a T test one, it's not going to show up on your test. But you could use the data. There are 16 male and 24 female anole lizards in a population. Half of the males are blue, the other half are yellow, quarter of, the, quarter of them. So here we have some proportions. So what I would do here to figure this out is I would make a graph or table, because then you could figure out proportions. So what's the probability of a blue lizard, given that it's male? So what I'd have to do is sort for males. Then get the number that are blue, and then you could figure out the percent blue given the total of males. So yellow male or a yellow female. So this one here you would need to get the percent yellow males, and then you would add to it the percent yellow females. Is selecting yellow and or blue male is a mutually exclusive event? Um, so to answer this one here, you'd have to look at, compare the, um, if you can add them up. And if they add up to one, then you know they're mutually exclusive. If they add up and they don't. Or you could just think your way through it. And if you think through it, you could probably answer the question. Events C and D are not mutually exclusive. Okay. The probability of C is 0.5. Probability D is 0.5. While the probability of D and C is this. Are these two events independent? So what I would need to do here to figure this one out. Uh, this actually doesn't make any sense. Are these independent? So the way that we could show that events are independent meaning that we can multiply them, is there is no causality. It's not necessarily that they would have to equal zero, but what I need to show is the probability of this would equal the probability of C times the probability of D. So if you can think your way through that, hooray. According to the internet, six chocolate-covered espresso beans are equivalent to one cup of coffee. Okay. However, when you eat six, you don't feel like you had a cup of coffee, so you're a bit skeptical. Uh, you run a couple of tests on the amount of caffeine and the number of espresso beans. Uh, okay, is it true that the number of espresso beans is equivalent 
is there. So again, this is a t-test question. You would need to um, ask the question of, hey, is like, you know, the equivalent of six of them equaling to a cup of coffee? We need to look at what the data set says. So if you know, this is the content for um, the number of, or the amount of caffeine. Oop, too far. So we'd have to come up with whatever our null hypotheses are. So here again, we're looking to see, hey, does the population average equal the sample or do they not happen to equal each other? Hooray. We've done the coding before. It's all conclusions all based upon that p-value. But again, it's a t-test. You need a late night snack and you have in your pantry are almonds, dried cranberries, and old white chocolate chips from Christmas. You decide to mix them all together and find out the white chocolate chips are a bit nasty. Then your power goes out and you can't tell what you're putting in your mouth. Uh, here we need to know the total of everything to figure out the probability of picking up one of these. So I'd have to figure out the probability of an almond, probability of a dried cranberry, and the probability of white chocolate. Which would just be the number out of the total. And then you know, you run through the probabilities just by calculating them, and it says an or, so you can add them up. If you choose two items from your bowl, what's the probability of at least one of them being a dried cranberry? So at least one of them. So this is going to be binomial. And if you think about it, and at least one either means you have to come up with all the other possibilities, or it's going to be one minus another probability. Just saying. You're helping out a grad student with field work and you pull three signs at each site and you sample a total of 12 sites. Record the number of signs that you caught. Number of signs you caught stingrays. Okay, that sentence does not make sense. Uh, the data is shown below. So according to your data set, what's the probability of catching a stingray in a sign? Oh, record the number of signs you caught stingrays. Yeah, that could still be written easier. So what's the probability of catching one? So it's just, you could take what you have up there. If your data follow binomial distribution, what's the probability that you would expect to catch more than one sign at a given site? So you would need to make... your binomial distribution, and then figure out the probability of having one or more. So that's the only way that you're going to be able to figure that one out. If you remember, we would make those, we'd pick a location, and then we'd add up everything to the right of it, which turned out to be one minus, you know, uh, d binom. If your test followed in binomial distribution, how many sites would you expect to, uh, if you followed it, how many sites would you expect to catch zero stingrays? So this one here, if you figure out the probability of this, then multiply it by the 12 sites, you'll get your answer. Coin to a pub paper published in the Shark Lab, proportion of stingrays caught in signs is about 0.64. The sampling period was done in El Nina, or El Nina year, El Nina year, or La Nina. I'm feeling very confused by that, where the water was significantly cooler than most years. So if it's cooler, that should be El Nino. Did this influence stingray abundance? So here, our null would be, hey, I expect to see 0.64. My alternative would be, I do not expect to see 0.64 in terms of the distribution. So this one here would be make your distribution and then you uh, figure out the probability of, you know, do you happen to land where you think it should be? Meaning your data, like do the data that you see 
Um, actually, sorry. So they're getting 0.64. You need to see if your data happened to match that 0.64. So you make a distribution of the data. And then where does 0.64 land in the distribution? You could also do the binom test in order to figure that one out too. But if you were to graph it, if you land, like if your average at the 0.64 is somewhere in here. Yeah, it's pretty likely, but if it's, you know, one of these extremes, then clearly we're having something go on, and then if you were to run, uh, calculate the p-value, you'd get a really small number. Chronic wasting disease is a brain disease of deer and elk, that, and it's one of the few groups uh, transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, which are associated with prions. Uh, chronic wasting disease is thought to associate proximity of agriculture fields. Deer, da 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 da. Okay, so here we happen to have um, an area. So this one here. Since we're dealing with a behavior, like are they choosing to eat in an agriculture or a natural area, I would call this an odds ratio. I would probably not go with a chi-square test. Because then it's a, oh, you know, you have an increased odds of getting this bad disease if you happen to be in an agriculture area. So I would use an odds ratio. So odds ratio is 1 for our null, odds ratio is not 1, and then you'd run the test. So just for the sake of remembering this one here, because I'm saying odds ratio, I would use um, epi tools, because an odds ratio chi-square is different. So you then have to make your table. So from your data, you make a table, then you turn that into a matrix. Remember your table, you're going to use cases. And then your matrix, then you would run your odds ratio test. In a normal population of trees, the average seed... I've seen this before. I'm going to cross it off. Previously done. A uh, group of psychologists are interested in determining if private practice donors and hospital do doctors have the same distribution of working hours. So they survey 150 practitioners. Um, here, like it's not necessarily a cause and effect like you're, like you're hired where you're hired. So this one here, I would look at just a normal chi-square test. So we're going to look to see, hey, is there independence? Meaning, like, the proportions should all be the same. So here I would say the expected frequency equals the observed frequency. Meaning, everything's equally distributed. And here, obviously, it would be not. So you take your data. You make a table. We're going to use count in this case to your matrix to your chi-square test. Remember, with your chi-square test, you actually need to name it into something, and then you ask it to show you your values. So yeah, this is just me off the top of my head. Here's how I'd answer everything.